Good morning. It is Sunday morning. You knew that though, didn't you? Because that's why you're here. But uh, I'll tell you what, I love Sunday mornings. Excited to have the opportunity to be here and to fellowship around God's Word with you this morning. And so we uh, look forward to what God's going to do and trust that you are eager and hungry to see what God's going to do in your life through His Word this morning as well. Take your Bibles, if you will, turn over to 2 Samuel chapter 12. 2 Samuel chapter 12. We're going to look this morning, truth is not relative. You know, we live in a world where it's getting hard to recognize the truth, isn't it? You're constantly scratching your head, searching and wondering, well, so-and-so said this, and this other place said this, and, and I, the places that we used to be able to trust to provide us the truth now seems to be as much about not telling the truth as it is about hoping that they tell the truth. And unfortunately, we even find in many of our churches today that the truth, the truth of Jesus Christ and salvation and His death on the cross for the forgiveness of sins is being pushed to the side. And the truth is not always as dominant in preaching as it should be. So this morning we're going to look at truth and the fact that it is is not relative. Have you ever heard that phrase? Well, the truth is relative. The truth is based on your perception. You stand at a fork in a road and there's two guards. One will tell you the path that leads in the right direction. One will tell you always a lie and tell you that this path is the correct one. What question would you ask? Do you ever face that dilemma in your life? Am I going to get the truth? Am I not going to get the truth? Is it somebody's perception of the truth or is it actually the truth? When you face that at times you feel like you're faced with a riddle. I have to solve this in order to figure out whether I'm being told the truth or not. What about you this morning? Do you recognize the truth? Do you understand the truth? Do you tell the truth? You see, many times the truth today, people do not call it a specific truth. It's their version of the truth. You know, number one, the truth doesn't care who you are. 2 Samuel 12, 1, And the Lord sent Nathan unto David. You know, God places people in our lives to tell us the truth, and Nathan was that person in David's life. David had sinned. God knew David had sinned. David knew that David had sinned. And God sent Nathan to tell David, He gave him an example, an illustration. He walked David all the way through that illustration. And ultimately, he looked at David and he said, after David's pronouncement, you're that man. You're that man. You see, then David was faced with the truth of the matter. He had a decision to make. But you see, oftentimes we don't listen to the truth when it's presented to us. We automatically become defensive and we step back and we we make excuses. We need to get to a point in our lives where we recognize the truth as the truth, plain and simple. Nothing added, nothing taken away. There's not a small lie, there's not a big lie, there's not a little white lie. But God puts people in your path to tell you the truth. And it's always a good idea when that truth is presented that you sit up and take notice because God put that person there for a reason. And to ignore the truth that's been presented to you, especially from that person that God has placed in your life, puts you on dangerous ground. It doesn't matter whether you believe it to be the truth. It doesn't matter whether you agree with the truth. That's the interesting thing about the truth. Especially where God is involved, the truth is the truth, plain and simple. Options are about to be put before you when the truth is presented. Decisions will determine your direction. When you have that decision, whether to accept the truth, deny the truth, whether to tell the truth or not tell the truth, it's going to determine the direction that you take from that point forward. David had a decision to make at this point. Which direction will I go from here? Will I acknowledge what Nathan said is truth, or will I backpedal and give him an explanation? You see, what was following this encounter 
were the consequences of that sin. And oftentimes people do not want to face the truth because of the consequences that they know are going to come because of the truth not being told. Because of the action that required... Do you ever stop and realize that there is some action that is performed that is related to that truth? There's a reason that there's a truth and a lie. And it's often action-based. Did I do something, think something, say something that I shouldn't have said? Now I have the opportunity to tell the truth about why it was done or a decision that I need to make in my life that will bring me either closer to God or push me farther away from God. The key is how do we view the truth in our life? Do we desire the truth? Or are we afraid of the truth? Do you think that if Nathan hadn't started with this illustration and he simply walked up and said, David, you've sinned. And I know you've sinned and God knows that you've sinned. I wonder how different the reaction might have been. You see, David had time to think through the situation, to think through the illustration, to determine what in his mind would be right or wrong. You see, it didn't really matter whether David agreed or disagreed with what was told, does it? Was it going to change the fact that it was the truth if David disagreed? If he said, Nathan, I don't know what you've heard. I don't know who's been telling you what's been going on, but I don't seem to remember it quite the way you put it forward. Uh, Nathan, if we sit and we discuss this, you will understand how this can't be the truth. Or he could have said, like many people do, let me give you the reasons why this happened. You notice Nathan didn't ask for an explanation, did he? He didn't say, David, go ahead and tell me what happened. He didn't say, David, why don't you go ahead and tell God what your excuse is? You see, it was taken care of right then and there. Truth is always sent by God and lies come from Satan. When you realize that anything other than the complete truth is at minimum a misrepresentation of the truth, then you'll realize that it's not of God. Turn over, if you will, to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. You know, it's a really simple concept, and it really should serve as a constant reminder to us of the things that lies present. The involvement that Satan has in every lie that's told. The Bible says that we can't serve two masters, so if we're not telling the truth and the truth is is of God, then who does the lie come from? It takes on a little different perspective under those guidelines, doesn't it? I mean, who would stand up and say, well, every time I, I tell a lie, I'm not serving God? John chapter 8, verse 43, Why do you not understand? This is Christ speaking. Why do you not understand my speech? even because you cannot hear my word. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar, and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not? When you begin to look at this statement, it adds more definition and specificity to what the lie really entails. You do not have the ability to stand in the midst of a lie and assign any of its attributes to God, which should be a constant reminder to us of the importance of the truth, especially in the service of God. Satan will tell you any lie that you want to hear. He will hope that you believe any lie that you hear. He will help you to create a situation in your mind and in your perception that calls it something other than a lie. Have you ever had somebody say, well, it really wasn't the whole truth, but it really wasn't a lie. What does that tell you? If a lie doesn't contain part of the truth, the truth can't encapsulate part of a lie either. 
How many people, though, in their lives are quite content from day to day to live that life? To get to the point where they don't appreciate the truth. We'll look at that more in just a moment, but the truth doesn't change. That's the great thing about the truth, isn't it? When we look at God's Word, it's truth. It's not about the truth. It is truth. And it doesn't change. God's Word is always truth. God's promises always remain. Truth corresponds to reality. You can't speak truth and make it up. There's something real about it. Truth constitutes reality. Again, it doesn't change. It speaks about the reality of whatever situation is at hand. Whatever emotion is at hand. Stop and consider when put in that hard spot. Whether you think it's going to hurt somebody's feelings, whether you think it's going to get you in trouble, no matter what your thought process is, is your first reaction always the truth? Now, stop and think before you answer that. Because the average person would love to say, yes, it is. But how many times in reflection does someone look back and say, you know, I really, I really wasn't being quite truthful about that? How defensive do you get when the truth is presented to you? Are you that person that the hair stands up on the back of your neck and you say, now hold it? Because oftentimes when people don't understand the truth or they don't appreciate the truth or they don't desire the truth, it becomes a defensive situation. Something about that defensiveness stands there and tells you there's more to this than meets the eye. Because if we desire truth and we accept truth, do we not demonstrate the ability and the desire to grow by the truth? It gets difficult during life when we face situations where the truth is presented in a way that we have to acknowledge that there's something wrong in us. That's the part that brings up the defensiveness. I don't want to admit that I'm wrong. I don't want to admit that I need to change. I don't want to admit even that God requires a change. But stop and consider what denial of the truth will mean. That decision that's going to mandate your direction. What's going to happen? Truth always reveals something. It'll either show you who you are. It'll show your desire to either accept it or deny it or debate it. You ever heard somebody say, well, that's your version of the truth. That opens up a debate, doesn't it? Because then the debate steps aside from reality and it goes to perception. No, it is truth because this is what I think. That's not why it's truth. It's truth because of what God's Word or a principle of God says, not because of how I view it. We have the ability as people often to to twist and to turn. We can manipulate a situation or a truth or a half-truth. We can manipulate that to our liking, to our advantage. The truth comes with a period at the end of it, doesn't it? We're not asking about whether or not this is a truth. The Bible plainly states truth. People like to add the question marks. The ellipse. There's there's something in here that we're not seeing, and therefore it it changes what God's Word really says. God's Word, again, is not going to change. Truth should help us to change. Again, that truth that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins... Christ Himself said that from the very beginning, Satan was a liar. Isn't it interesting that people who say they believe God's Word can read that out of Christ's own mouth and yet either lie or be taken into a lie? It's not complicated, is it? 
If it's a lie, it's not of God. That means it's from Satan. That should make life pretty simple, shouldn't it? We should not have in any way, shape, or form a desire to tell a lie. And if you ask the average person, they may stand up and say, I don't lie. I don't lie. Guess what you just did? You just lied. Or maybe we should have rephrased it and said, have you ever lied? But we begin to stop and realize, how does it affect me? How does it affect my testimony? How does it affect others in my life? You see, the truth spoken plainly could put an end to a lot of discussions, couldn't it? You delete the debate and act the discussion about what's right. Progress becomes evident. The debate associated with a lie usually doesn't end well because the debate itself creates emotional distress. But have you ever met that person who said, I have lied long enough. I have come to the end of the road and I don't know where to go. I need somebody to tell me the truth. Those are the opportunities where God begins to work. When you believe the truth to be relevant, it changes the direction and the, the receipt of the truth. Turn, if you will, over to 1 Timothy chapter 2. Paul had things to say about the truth as well. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 7 says, Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle, I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. Paul was confident in his approach because he knew that he spoke the truth, just as Nathan was confident when he stepped in front of David. The boldness of the truth becomes evident. But are sometimes maybe people afraid to be bold in the truth for fear of the debate that will ensue? That finger that points back at him and says, Now look, you're telling me this especially when it comes to sharing God's Word. Let me, let me be of a help to you. Let me share God's Word. Let me help you through this matter in your life. And they have to sit there and look at you as one who is filled with hypocrisy. Who do you think you are to help me? You're, you're not even telling the truth. You're telling me what God's Word says, but not what you do. Hypocrisy is in and of itself a lie, is it not? I'm saying one thing and doing another, or I say one thing here and say something else here. That consistency and that faithfulness that implements the principles of God's Word are not just spoken, but they're lived. And if that level of attention to God's Word isn't evident to the others, they're going to view you as one who speaks not the truth. In Galatians 4 and verse 16, Paul said, Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? He was confident in the truth, but he had, for some reason, to ask this question. Today we would say, why are you getting mad at me? I'm telling you the truth. What motive does the truth have except edification? Because therein lies the power of the truth. But how many people are willing to accept what the Bible says as truth and to grow from there? Why would it be necessary for Paul to have to ask, well, I'm telling you the truth, why are you mad at me? It demonstrated a level of immaturity in their Christian life, didn't it? Because when you fail to accept the truth that is spoken, that it means that you have a desire to live a life on precepts and principles other than that associated with truth. Don't tell me what I need to do because I'm still doing what I want to do. The truth provides accountability and responsibility. Does a mirror tell the truth? Stop and think about that one for a second. Is what I see in the mirror 
real. Got your answer? Got it tucked right up in there? I should have you write it down and hand it to me afterwards. Raise your hand if you think you're right. Doesn't matter what your answer is if you think you're right. Okay. A mirror doesn't, it, the image in the mirror isn't real because it's in a mirror. It's a reflection. It's not reality. You doubt that? Why then on the side of your car mirror does it say objects in the mirror are closer than they appear? If it was real, then there would be no need for that phrase, would there? Remember in the old cars that wasn't there? So that means at some point, somebody backed into something and got out and said, nobody told me that the objects were closer than they appeared. That mirror should have been realistic. So if a mirror is realistic, then what do you do with the house of mirrors that's at the fair? You know, the ones that change your shape, and they change your height, the ones that wiggle and make you sick at your stomach after you just got off the roller coaster. You see, if the image in the mirror was real, which one of those are reality? And too many people live their lives looking at something other than reality. As if they were looking in a mirror. Satan would love those mirrors. You just pick which one you like the best. You ever come out of that house of mirrors laughing and go, you know that one that made me look really, really tall? I always wanted to be tall. And now I know what I would look like if I was really tall. Not true, is it? Because the minute you step away from the mirror, you are faced with reality. And when we step away from the mirror of God's word, we're faced with reality. The difference is God's word is true. It shows us who we are for real. And quite often it's not something to enjoy. It's not something to look at with great admiration and say, oh, look at who I am. You know, it's the same as with cameras. Everybody learns a certain angle now that they can use for their, their pictures that they post. A photographer told us not too long ago, if you hold it up and out just a little bit, it, it makes you look thinner. I don't think there's anybody out there looking for the ugly filter. Let me make myself look as, as ugly and out of proportion as, as it can. But how many people are spending their life trying to filter it to make themselves look like something that they're not? You've seen the other filters where you can, you know, take 20 years off of yourself and you can take all those little lines and, and all those little attributes that you've gained with your years and just make you look 20 years younger. Those seem to be fairly popular because you look and you go, who is that? And then somebody calls you, did you see my picture? Satan wants you to look at yourself and say, I can get out of this. I can still come out smelling like a rose. How did that work for anybody throughout Scripture who either bought into a lie or told a lie? Did Achan get away with anything? Did the people in the days of Noah realize that, hey, you know what? Noah was telling the truth. Did Pharaoh in Egypt realize that God was telling the truth? That he had sent Moses to tell him what needed to be told? You have to realize that there's constant adjustment in life, but never adjustment to truth. In other words, we adjust our lives to follow truthful Scripture but Scripture will not adjust. John 18, 38 said, Pilate saith unto him, speaking to Christ, what is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and saith unto them, I find in him no fault at all. You know, Pilate had a great question. 
What is truth? Because you see, truth demands a decision. It dispels confusion. If you recognize truth for what it is, you know what you need to do. The confusion that exists when it comes time to answer to a situation. Do I tell the truth? Do I tell a lie? Do I mix the two? Do I find something that will make me look better than what I am or keep me from a dilemma that I might face? Pilate said it. And that's the question that you have to answer in your heart this morning. What is truth? You see, too many people don't have truth in their soul. Truth should be pervasive in our soul. But too many people view truth as an invader of their soul. What about you this morning? What is truth to you? Could you ask the question as Pilate asked? What is truth? Maybe you could ask the question, what is truth to you? When we go to the Lord in prayer, we're laying there and our head's on our pillow at the end of the night and we're looking back over the day. Are we truthful with the Lord? You know, isn't it amazing how we could see children who thought they could get away with something, who believed in their ability to enhance the truth in such a way that they could avoid consequences? In that first sign of realization, I just told a lie. I shouldn't have told a lie because back then there was innocence involved. And it pricked their little conscience. And it brought sorrow. You see, it wasn't about the punishment that it was associated. It was the fact of, I didn't tell the truth. Later, there came a point in life where we realized that if we told a lie to someone, we could hurt them, we could disappoint them. And that brought another level of shame and reproach to our hearts. So the question today is, what is the reproach that we feel regarding our inability to be completely honest with God? David said, search me, O God, and know my heart. See if there be any wicked way in me. Renew in me a right spirit. Is that really our prayer? Or are we afraid that if God shows us something through His Word that is the truth, then we have to incorporate that into our lives? Do you find yourself saying, I have a choice whether to give something up that I enjoy doing, that I desire to do, that I have come to find a great place in my life for it. Or do I want to hold on to it? When Christ told the young ruler, you can follow me, but you need to go sell all your stuff. You see, that brought about a truth. It brought about a decision. It brought about a change in direction. Because in reality, the question became, how badly do you want to follow me? So we can stand and justify how truthful we are But you see, there's a list that follows. And each of the items on the list start with three words. Are you willing? Are you willing to do this, which is shown in my word? Are you willing to give up this, which is talked against in my word? Are you willing only to serve me? But Lord, can I I not? And here comes the debate. 
We didn't read the period at the end, did we? Lord, why can't I do this and this? There's a song that we've sung, many of us, for many years. It says, is your all on the altar of sacrifice late? You see, there's another point where we can decide whether we want to tell the truth or not. Do I have everything on the altar tonight, today? Is my whole heart God's? Am I fully committed to the things of God? Have I come fully to the realization that the direction that my life is headed is not in accordance with Scripture? Has there ever been a time when you bowed your head and closed your eyes and said, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. And, and I know that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Or have you lied to yourself and said, I'm good enough. I've done enough. I've gone to church all my life. You see, those are the lies that Satan likes. If we were good enough, then who are we now? And are we good enough every day? And how many days that we're not good enough does it take before heaven's not an option in the mind of so many? But you see what the truth says is that I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh to the Father but by me. That is the truth. And it is not relevant or it's not relative, it's very relevant. And it won't change. But you see, here's where the truth comes into play. Am I willing to admit that I need a Savior? Are you ready to say, I can accept that free gift? But this morning, are you willing to understand that the truth doesn't change? The truth doesn't care who you are. The truth demands a decision. We have options every single day. I can tell the truth. I can tell a lie. I can do what's wholly right or partially right. You know, Satan's just as happy with you doing less than your best. Almost as much as he is with you doing nothing at all. Because you go long enough doing less than your best, and it might just end up doing nothing at all. And you can sit today and say, oh, I'm, I'm here in the church pew and that's not me. You don't understand of all the things. So there's that word again, all. You see, it's easy to get caught up in that lie, isn't it? The, the thought was, I, I do all of everything, everything that I do, I do it for God. and God's all I think about. All is a big word, isn't it? It's a wide in scope word, isn't it? But you see how easily it pours from our mouth. Oh, I always do the right thing. What about you this morning? What do you think of the truth when it comes to the truth itself? And most of all, how willing are you to be honest with God? If you'll bow your heads and close your eyes. A lot of questions this morning. A lot of scripture that should cause us to consider. I hope that you don't leave this morning saying, the pastor just called me a liar. 
not my intent. My intent is solely this. God knows whether you're lying or not. God knows the level of truth that pervades your life. You may be able to fool everybody, but I can promise you and I challenge you this morning to understand that you can't fool God for one minute. Not for a second. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, you know, you asked that question about if I had ever accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior, if I understood that Christ died on the cross for me. That requires honesty as well. Lord, I'm, I'm a sinner. I've, I've done wrong. Just one sin makes us a sinner, doesn't it? Or maybe you're here this morning and you say, I never really thought about some of these things in the way that they've been presented. I'm not totally truthful. I'm not viewed as an honest individual. And even if others think I'm honest, God knows who I really am. And you would say this morning, Lord, it's time that I told the truth. It's time that I looked for all of what you would have me to do in my life, not just what I want to do or, or what I think to be the truth. Ephesians 4.25 says, Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his, with his neighbor. That should be a guiding principle in our life. Something to consider this week as we go forward. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us. Lord, we thank you for your word and the truth that's in it. We just pray that you would burden our hearts, Lord, with the need for truth in every area and every aspect of our lives. Lord, most of all with you. Help us to grow from the truth, to learn, to be able to have an impact in the lives of others. Most of all, to be known for the integrity of truth. God, and direct us now as we leave. Thank you for each and every one that's here and has heard your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. I trust that uh, God's word will continue to work even after we leave and that uh, it will be a blessing to you.